Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to today's Split Master Class. We have a very special guest with us today, Mr. Thorne. Mr. Thorne, could you please take a moment to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm the flute professor at Northwestern, and I've been there for about, um, I've been there for now 10 years in September. And before that, I played for the, in the Houston Symphony for about 20 years. Thank you so much. And our performers today are, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, <laughs> Aliyah, who's playing Mozart Concerto in D major, and who's playing Shamanat Concertino. Oh, I'm not oh. mispronouncing that either. And yes. Ellie, who's playing Boza in Mosh for a solo flute. Um, could you guys yeah. please introduce yourselves in order? Hello, um, I'm Aaliyah. Uh, do you want me to give like a brief synopsis or do you just want me to say my name or? <laughs> Tell me about where, how long you've been studying, where home is for you and how long you've been working on the Mozart. Okay, um, so I currently live in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I've been playing flute since sixth grade. I've been working on this piece specifically for six months, maybe about then. Um, I forgot the other questions. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, that's, that's good. That, okay. that tells me a little bit there. And then you were going to go on to the next person, you know? Yeah. Hi, Mr. Thorne. Um, I'm Anne and I am from Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, I started learning the flute in sixth grade and um, I have been, I learned the Shamanad in seventh grade and then I've been working on it like on and off since then for like various competitions and stuff. Okay. So Little Rock is home. Got it. Hi, Mr. Thorne. Um, I'm Eloise, or you can call me Ellie. Um, home for me is in Frederick, Maryland, but I just graduated from the Interlock and Arts Academy um, in Michigan, so I've been living there. Um, today, I'm playing the Boza Image, which is very new because I just finished all of my rep for high school. Um, I've been working on it for about three weeks to a month. So. Okay. And did I meet you at ARIA, Ellie? Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes I you remember. did. remember. Yes. Nice to see you again. You as well. Um, okay, uh, yes, interlocking, I remember that. And I'm going to, they have, uh, they're working on the AC in my uh, unit. So I'm going to put a fan on because in this room it's a little warm. Let me know if when I put that fan on, it disturbs the mic a little bit. So Sounds good. We'll see, because that'll give me a little bit of fresh circulating air. So if it causes problems, I'll turn it off. All right. All right, so uh, you wanted to start with Aliyah, is that correct? Yep. And um, how much of this would you like to play, Aaliyah? Um, as much as you'd like to hear. I prepared the first movement, and I have the cadenza too, but I didn't sh like send you the cadenza. So I've got a copy here. I had one of those okay. at home. Do, would you like an opportunity to perform? you know, the, the uh, exposition and development for your colleagues? Or would you like to just perform the ex exposition and we can start to do some work together? I'm happy to give you the opportunity to perform a bit for your colleagues if you'd like. Okay, that sounds good. All right, so why don't you play through the end of the development? Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. And if you see me looking to the left, it's because I'm just looking at my score, which is on the stand next to me. Okay. All right. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm getting, is the sound cutting out for other people as well? Is it just me? I think it might be. Aaliyah, could you try turning on original sound? It is on. I made sure it was on before I came here. And are you using your internal microphone on a laptop or uh, on the- I'm on my iPod right now. So iPad. I don't have an external and microphone. And so, right, I see. Uh, and are you using, yeah, because is there any way you could switch to a laptop? Because it also can be that sometimes with Wi-Fi, it overloads. Mm. If you're using Wi-Fi, it can be sometimes slow it down since it's a fairly big amount of information we're transmitting. I don't have a laptop. 
I only have my iPad and my phone with me. Um, well, let's try one other thing then. Will you go ahead and just do a test? Will you turn on? I'm going to ask you to play uh, just the first, uh, the first like 16 measures, and then while you're playing, will you go ahead and turn off the speaker? So that way we might prevent the uh, feedback between your mic and your speaker, which are on the same system. Does that make sense? What do you mean turn off my speaker? You are going to mute your uh, your 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 ability to listen. So, oh. all right. Yeah, so you can, you want me to help you with this? At the bottom of your iPad uh, Zoom application, do you see, and this may be different because I'm looking at it on a laptop. Do you see a, um, menu bar at the bottom where you see a little mic symbol and an up arrow an up arrow you know uh, a pop-up so oh. allows you and if you can access anything that helps you with the audio settings that would allow you to turn off your uh your speaker while you play that might cause less interference while you're okay. on the laptop so when you do that just play about 16 measures and then come check back in and we'll let you know if the mic is coming through. Okay. All right. take care of it so why don't we just since uh, we won't be able to interrupt you as you're playing why don't you play the exposition and let's just check in with everybody could everyone here uh, maybe in chat let you not know if there was any problems but that was great and that's a okay. good solution thank you I'm sorry about that <laughs> oh no no it, it's it's uh, you know having used zoom a lot the last couple of years I figured out the different tricks and that's that's definitely helpful so why don't you play the exposition, go ahead and turn off your speaker, and then when you're done, you'll come back on and turn the speaker on. Okay, sounds good. Thank you.
Rebecca. Good job. Good job. Just a couple of things. It'll be a little hard um, with the mic issue for us to do a lot while you play because uh, we won't be able to hear you well. But let me give you a couple of things to think about. Um, I think a very helpful thing would be to practice with a metronome set at half notes because that will that as opposed to the metronome giving you quarter notes and kind of keeping the inner subdivision going for you. If you use half notes, you'll be then having to keep that inner quarter note pulse yourself. So I would practice it with the metronome on a bigger beat. And I think that'll take care of a lot of things there. I think a lot of the passages with the slur to tongue to uh, tonguing pattern, I would practice them all slurred to try and even out the fingers first of all. Because then when you uh, put the tonguing pattern onto those technical passages, you'll know that the, the, the fingers are moving evenly and in a regulated fashion. I think sometimes you might want to do a little bit of work on that slur to tongue to pattern, even just on a couple of notes that you would play in context. So could you play... Um, Or if you want to just play a D major arpeggio, playing in essence a eighth note and two sixteenth note rhythm. Let's just check the tonguing. Good. I think what's happening is you're stopping your air a little bit at the end of the eighth note. And I would think of it as long in this case because that will keep your fingers a little more even. That makes sense? Yeah. Now, if you would play, because it seems to be uh, holding up now our connection, would you play at 161? That's that last 16th note pattern. Play If you would play it all slurred and at a very comfortable tempo, as in... That's, uh, I think that will, you'll realize there's a lot of fingers moving there and a lot of forked fingerings. That's an awkward pattern for everybody. So you're dealing with all those C sharps and Ds, spending a little time getting comfortable with the balance of the flute in your hand. be noticing there are different fingerings moving at different times you want to make sure you have very good balance points in terms of the tube that you're holding so really make sure that you're letting your right hand thumb help stabilize the lower part of the tube and that index finger will you just once try holding the flute for me and lifting all your fingers away except for these balance points that you have on the flute really go ahead and lift your fingers up so you're there you go once you have that flute really held in a stable fashion it'll be a lot easier to to keep the tube steady in your hands and let me ask you a couple of questions what do you think is a, a classical style mozart what's different about mozart say than bach or schumann or beethoven or one of the romantic era composers that we talk about mahler i think Bach, or sorry, I think Mozart is very particular. I think he added each of these um, slurs and like the tongue to, uh, tongue to slur to like uh, patterns like that all intentionally. I think everything was put here with intention and I think it's very meticulous like in that way. Um, so I think like my biggest struggle while playing this music is to try and keep that sort of clean style um and to keep the lightness to it as well because there's a lot of notes and i know he I, added all i the think notes you're very method. right about the idea of a light style and i think that you know baroque style is perhaps even lighter less uh legato less sustained but this is m little slightly more sustained than that and then you move into early and then late beethoven and the legato gets even longer so i think here in general i would say the lengths of the quarter notes could be slightly shorter as in the very opening, which I'll just ask you to work on that with me. Um, if we could play. Hmm? 
I'm gonna just try that gesture. So in general, I'm hearing your, your quarter notes will be fairly long and I'd have a bit more space. If we practice it very slowly, sometimes that can be very helpful with our phrasing. And that's an idea that comes from, I believe, Moise talking about that, where you're going to practice the, the control of the airstream slowly at first. try that you'll realize there's like a slight mini taper at the end of each quarter note yes why would we have a slightly uh, less elongated quarter note because if you think about the piano and the keyboard say that Mozart was playing uh, they were not a modern piano so they they were you know he clavichord and on the way to pianoforte, which was the instrument that people used in the early Romantic era, they didn't have the sustaining quality that we have in a modern piano. And if you look at some of the older uh, instruments and performance practice, they're a little bit more space. The same thing applies to the eighth note. I think those can be a bit shorter, as in... And you'll notice that I'm releasing the end of the slurs at the end of the E and the G. So we have to be, I have to be careful uh, to stay on schedule because it's always hard to work with three different people. There is one other thing I would suggest in that Alberti bass section that everyone uh, has to spend some time with. This is measure 44, Aaliyah. There, I wouldn't clip this, the second note of the slur. And, but first of all, I would practice the wide intervals. I'm gonna just try that without the A's as if they were detaché or tongued eighth notes. Sure. So I'm playing the F and the D and the G and the C sharp. I'm going to start at measure 43, or 43. Wherever you would feel comfortable starting. Good. I think that's the biggest thing to work out because really what that is is that having to play those fairly wide intervals in the case of the F sharp to the D there where you're playing, what does that end up being? A 14th, right? It's beyond an octave. We're not used to doing that in flutes. We don't play that a lot and we don't have an octave key. So we've got to get there on our air column. So I would work on that and then realize when you practice it slowly, elongate your second and fourth 16th notes. I think what you'll find, the more disjunct the passage is, the less short you will need to play anything because it has a certain distinction to it because of the wide intervals. Does that make sense? Yes. And just a couple of things I'm gonna throw out there to, for you to think about. Um, let's see, yeah, I would practicing everything slurred. Check your accidentals and measure 125. If you'll just make a note of that. And then uh, I think I've got, I, we were able to cover it all, believe it or not. How about that? Wow. Uh, and I think practicing, ah, yes, in measure 88, make sure you don't clip the half notes. And I think practicing with your metronome on the half note, giving you, uh, say, 60 as opposed to 120 or 50, 56 or whatever tempo you like it at will really help you with that. Do you have any questions for me? Has this made sense? Is there anything I can explain better? Uh, I do have a question. So when you were talking about like measure 37, um, or just in general when I have like quarter notes, if I want to make them sound, have a little bit of a taper at the end or just a little bit more separated, how can I do that at such a fast tempo? How can I add the taper in at a fast tempo? I think right now just tapering even slowly is a new skill. So I think practicing your tapers in general and not trying to do it too quickly yet, it will be very slight in context, sounding like 
that bit of space. But to do that too soon, when you're not comfortable yet with the taper, will feel uncomfortable. So just practicing it as Now, in context, you won't go that soft, but that probably feels enough of a, 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 an initial challenge, and I'd start there, and then realize as you get more comfortable with it, you'll have that slight bit of space. You could think of it like a string player changing the direction of the bow, if you would like. Did that help give you a sense of how to work on it? Yes, thank you. I think we have to realize that we always get uh, very concerned about our fingers and about our, our tongue and tonguing patterns. And sometimes we forget to practice slowly our air and how we manipulate the air column and working with these slight inflection points. It was okay. great to hear you. I want to make sure I don't get too far behind schedule. I know very many good. of you may be trying to get uh, prepared for exams and stuff. I'm not worried if we stop, you know, uh, we, we can go a little past seven, but I realize people may want to eat dinner and, and write papers and do all those fun things, right? So right. ready when, uh, when I, so we're going on to Anne, right? Yes. Yep. Okay, let me get up my copy of the Chaminade. And like I said, if I'm ever looking to my left, it's because I'm looking at the score. I just don't have enough room on the desk to not crowd the screen. Okay. Um, How much so of this would have you, you like... had? Would you like to play a certain chunk of it, Anne? Are you looking forward to performing a bit for your colleagues? Is there anything you would like to target in particular? Um, I would like to target the cadenza. Sounds great. Would you like okay. to just go ahead and play the cadenza? And then yes, we'll do a little okay. talking? Mm -hmm. oh, I'll check my mic real quick. <laughs> I think we're okay. You might want to up the level or bring the mic a bit closer. Why don't you play a uh, high note and a forte? Okay, I think we'll be okay. and just play a little bit of the opening tune you just got to. Let's say from okay. uh, the tempo one there at measure 113 through, if you don't mind, the measure 126. And so that's oh, one. I don't have measure numbers. This would so... be the uh, tempo, the tempo one you just got to, and okay. you're going to play yeah, until see. three bars after the stringendo. Okay, good. This is very helpful. 
Hey, can you, just to ask us a question and for everyone to think about too when we're uh, here meeting as a group, what's the difference between the air in your first octave, the, how you position or use the air in your first primary octave on the flute versus the third octave above the staff? So the, the first octave is like the lowest octave? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, like when I... you were just where you had stopped in essence, the low D. What do you change with your air? How do you position your air there? And how is that different than say the D above the staff? What's different? in the higher register my air is more focused it's so like my arm shuffle is smaller smaller so the aperture is smaller in the third octave yes yeah. so what and would that mean in the low octave it's larger wider and do you feel wider. like it's the same shape in general or does it feel different I and mean, sometimes um, going to the mirror and looking and seeing what your embouchure looks like up close can be helpful okay i think in general just since we're uh, working as a group, you might find that the aperture is a bit wider, but not maybe necessarily as tall, but more blade-like. I don't know what the mic allows you to, or the camera allows you to see. So in general, I think that what I'm noticing, Anne, is that you might need to adjust the angle of the air to be lower in the low register. It seems like your corners are a bit engaged when they might be preventing you from dropping, releasing the air. So that's my next question. How do you want to angle the air for a low note? Are you going to blow down, across, or up? Um... Down. And I think what you'll notice is your corners of your embouchure are a bit too much engaged. And if you worked to release them a bit, it would allow you to drop the angle of the air. So what we're going to work towards is you'll notice there's a bit of air in the tone. I'm hearing... You'll hear that air. And we want to try and get more focus to the tone. Can you play a scale from, uh, in, in B flat major, you're going to play a scale from the D in the second octave down to the first. Wait, why not? So you oh, play D. D in the staff. Notice as you descend, the tone gets not as clear. Let's just slowly play that scale and see if you can keep the focus. So it's getting better. Just below the G, notice it's getting softer. Do you feel like you're changing the amount of air you're exhaling on a low D? So my other question to ask you is, do you feel like a low note takes more air or a different type of volume of air from a note of, and above the staff? Um, I think it takes more air. It does. And I think that as you go down to that low D, you might almost feel like you crescendo. <laughs> And another thing for you to think about is that also the shape of the vowel we use within the mouth will help to clarify or bring out different timbres within the tone. When you are in the third octave, Anne, what kind of vowel do you feel like your throat is set in? Remember those A, E, I, O, U things we all learned when we learned our alphabet? I think I do. E. E, yes. What do you notice about the tone above the staff sometimes? Is it flat or sharp? Um, sharp. Sharp. So do you think like the E vowel would sharpen the note or, or, or help to lower the pitch? 
I think it probably sharpened it. it. You're exactly right. So the more narrow the vowel, the harder the vowel, the more it'll lift the pitch. So in this case, you might want to work on using more O and O on terms of those upper octaves. Try that and see if you can get a more dolce quality. And you'll notice that there's certain positioning of the of the mouth and the way we use the tongue in the throat, in the and in the oral in the cavity, whatever is behind your teeth, you can shape all of that just like you do when you're speaking. So one of the challenges for this piece for, for young flute players is that just in that period of two bars, you've gone across two different octaves. You've been above the staff, in the staff, and going almost below the staff. And that's one of the challenges of this piece, is that you can evenly move between registers. So I have a quick exercise for you. Let's take that D above the staff and play three different Ds to be able to keep the phrase even, you've got to make sure that no octave is stronger or weaker than another initially. Okay, that low D is getting better. Will you try playing the D above the staff as thinking of it as piano? You're going to think the D in the staff as mezzo forte. You're going to think the low D as forte. would work on. I think largely the issue is that your corners are, are not allowing you to change the angle of the air. Do you take any time to practice your scales? Sort of. I know. Everyone's so yeah. busy these days. You're, you're volunteering. You're taking your classes. But even if you only have an hour to practice each day, but if you warm up for 10 or 15 minutes and work on your flexibility, scales are an excellent way to work on that. where you can work to slowly transition between two octaves. And if you don't play them regularly, even just playing them slowly, will help you balance that out. Last question, and I promise I'll move on from this topic in case you're getting a little bored with it. Your jaw, does your jaw get involved in terms of the angle of the air? Do, is it just the lips that we manipulate to change uh, if we want to blow the air lower or higher? I think I open up my jaw more when I play low notes. I think you're right. And another, there are many ways to think Ideally. of it. That people think of it in different ways. Some people think about the space between their front teeth. Some people think about the space between their molars in the back. But in essence, it's not a big change, but that realizing that that space will also allow you to change the angle of the air. Because if you have greater space between your teeth, you'll often find it's easier to, to aim the air down. So um, I would work on the center of the tone a little bit through those exercises. Um, I noticed that when you're playing, the airspeed is a little slow, and you can always identify that by the, the speed of the vibrato. So when you're vibrating the tone, you want to have a generally faster airstream. And I'm hearing the speed of the vibrato maybe a tad slower than that. You want to try whatever your favorite measure there where you have that octave spread. Yes, I heard a huge difference and I'd be curious to ask your colleagues. Let me put this in gallery mode and see, did, did people notice a difference? So yeah, everyone's doing their homework and stuff. Ah, we have hands raised. Yes, and thank you, Kara, for, st for staying in with us. 
So I think you'll find that your air is your best friend, Anne. That'll really help you to direct the air column and help support things. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, I would uh, get that air moving a bit more. Do you have another spot you want to make sure I'm still on time? I think actually I've, I've used all of our time. So, but let me make sure that I give you an opportunity to ask any questions you might have? Did I explain things well? May I? Is there anything I need to explain a little better? Um, yeah, so in the cadenza, are there any parts where I could like experiment more, or, like try new ways of phrasing and stuff? I think that, I've, I th yeah, think, I've been like doing the same thing for a while. Well, I think at this point that I would start with this, this tone control issue because once you have that flexibility, I think you'll have greater control of what you can do and you'll find there are many different ways to play any piece of music but the initial thing to start with is that you develop your ability to manipulate the airstream so i would encourage you to start there um, but there is one other thing though i would address is those octaves i think in general that's where we deploy the jaw the most helpful uh, tool and I think in general that that those were a little resistant. Do you want to just play those octaves for me before right. we move on to Ellie, I believe? Good. Wow, it says pianissimo. Let's try a little bit more introspective character. more like harmonics on a violin. Can you play that for me uh, to, uh, about half the volume? I'm not, it, Zoom is a little tricky. I'm not hearing a difference there. So here's the thing I would suggest as you wanted to develop the center of the tone, also practicing your tone exercises at different dynamics. A lot of people will practice their tone exercises always mezzo forte and forte. It might be very helpful for you to find out what you need to do to support the tone by playing piano pianissimo. If you're playing soft, there should be no difference to the center or quality of the tone versus. So that's what I would work on. And sometimes I think spending some time on these, examining these different skills can actually give you more progress sooner than jumping into the music that's printed right away because it's hard for you to analyze physically what you're doing when you're also distracted by notes and rhythms as I look here to the score on my left. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much, Anne. Thank you. Thank you. And I need to uh, open up the part. One second, Ellie, let me see where I've got mine stashed here. I have a scan already on the computer. I should have pulled that thank up you, a Anne. little earlier. Thank you, Anne. I just wanted to jump in and say, after Ellie's performance, we'll be taking a group picture and then having a short Q&A. So if everyone can stick around for the picture, that'd be great. Actually, uh, yes, I should be, I uh, should have opened this up sooner. All right, let me just open up the copy in the email that you already sent me a PDF of. Thank you for doing that, because that'll be a faster way to find it. And Ellie, you want to test your mic and see how uh, the levels are? Yeah, definitely. Just this. All right. It works. Cool. What would you like to do, Ellie? How much of this have you had a chance to perform? Would you like to perform a, a section of it, et cetera? Uh, I have no strong preferences about performance versus working. Um, I'd like to focus on the first page and we can go on if we have time. Why don't you do go ahead and play the first page uh, until we get to the, um, what am I trying to say there? To which section? 
Yeah, let's go up into the first cadenza. So let's go up to that high A flat, please. Absolutely. things to work on there is let me get on the right page I'm noticing where I'd like to have you spend some time examining how you connect those slurred notes sometimes I hear that you're almost accenting uh, the slurred notes will you play the first the E to the D Ellie Yes, good. And uh, will you play that from the beginning of that measure? That's much better. You now try that connecting that into the next version, an octave lower. So those first three measures of that uh, allegro monotropo. Good. How did that feel to you and what was the difference? It felt much freer and it felt like the line had just more momentum as, as opposed to kind of like more punches. Right. I think you can feel that kind of connection between notes. What, how will you create this scherzando quality then? Uh, so scherzando, I mean scherzo means a joke, right? It's kind of like um, that lighthearted feel. Um, I think the contrast between the staccatos and this kind of legato uh, connected lines, it's just mm -hmm. kind of back and forth and it kind of makes it almost ridiculous. So really bringing that out and accenting it is going to help. You might, it might be though that the articulations could be lighter. So, uh... So it's playful. You want to just try bringing that out? Um, I don't know if my demo comes through via <laughs> Zoom, which is always a tricky part of teaching via Zoom. Sure. Ah, I have a better way of saying what I was trying to say earlier. Okay. When you get to a long note, do you feel like you drop your support? So in essence, do you feel like if the same amount of air at the end of the E is at the beginning of the D and at the end of the D is at the beginning of the D? Now that I think about it, no, but I don't think I noticed I was doing it. And I, well, it's, it's, the, it's the challenge of being a flute player. <laughs> Since we don't have a bow that we can see, if our air is our bow, you know, you would notice if your bow slowed down on a long note or your teacher would right away just watching. So I think there, think about you keeping your level of support engaged on those long notes. Not, so that when you see a quarter note or a half note, you don't do less, you either sustain or do more by crescendoing or if you feel like the phrase is diminishing, then you diminuendo. Does that make sense? Yes. Try adding that in and see if that helps. Thank you. 
good. Good, good, good. And I think this relates to what we were working on with Anne is that you need your air is your energy. And without air, we don't have sound. And oftentimes as flute players, we can get obsessed with our embouchure. But really, if the air is traveling, we're going to be okay as long as it's roughly in the right area. Good. Now, what in, in musical terms, we might say that the E is an appoggiatura and later on that C, is, is C sharp is an appoggiatura, meaning it's the dissonant note that resolves, as in... Those are probably, we could sit on those notes and be, I uh, feel at rest as opposed to... Don't you feel it wants to resolve to that D? You know, it's like you, you to, to, to take a break, you'd have to get to the D. So we call that note an appoggiatura, and we have a dissonant note. We usually vibrate the dissonance. That's one of the typical things we do in, in classical, uh, European classical style music. Not always the case in, say, jazz and other styles of, of uh, music that have been grown up here in America, or Indian classical music. They might do things in a different way. They use a uh, different sense of tonality and modes. So here, though, we'll tend to, to give a little bit of sweetener to that note. Want to try that? It's like saying, if I'm sorry, it's terrible when a teacher does that, you get ready to play. <laughs> no but when, you, when you pronounce your name, you say Ellie, right? Mm -hmm. So I, when you're playing this, it's as if you're saying Ellie, da 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 ba ba Ellie, and I want you to think yum ba ka dum Ellie, da 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 ba ba Ellie. Finding out which notes get the stress is one of the key things to do when we're sorting out a phrase. much better and then whether thing uh, another concept or way to think about this idea of legato and connection is don't ever let your air know what your fingers are doing put your finger patterns on the air stream because I think sometimes you're will when you change your the fingering to go from an E to a D or a C sharp to a B you'll also change the air but actually the fingers are subservient to the air stream because the air stream is the energy source does that make sense Yes, it does. Good. Would you like to play a bit of this first cadenza you just got to, or is there any other spot you'd like to work on? Um, sure. I'll uh, go from Want to play those scales up to the high A flat and take us into your first cadenza? Yeah, that'd be great. Would you mind if I started... Um... Actually, you know what? I'll just start after the breath mark on the scales. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. Um, I think one of the things you notice a lot when students play this and a lot of performers that where you get to that last line where it says avec fantasy, everyone still plays it in rhythm. They just have dynamic differences. But I think what he's saying there is you should be as free as you like. <laughs> so that it feels as if there are two different voices in dialogue. Something to think about, There is that isn't the only way to play it, but I think that here you can realize that it doesn't have to be binary, where everything is in essence metered. He's saying be free. And I think this should sound uh, like a moment of indecision in terms of the piece. You shouldn't, the audience shouldn't know where you're going yet because you're almost deciding in front of them. And then this next pattern where you have the contrary motion between the two chromatic voices, as in. Mm -hmm. 
right? They're moving in two different directions. Mm -hmm. I think you can have a bit more uh, scherzando quality. So that it's as if two characters are having a uh, uh, dialogue in a movie or in a novel where the dominant voice is the louder voice and the questioning which is uh, said in an affirmative way or a commanding way and the the dolce or piano voice is unsure does that make sense yes so i would spend a little time just getting those scales clarified in your mind those are not common scales that we all play right so just let's just check those accidentals there how are you you which way are you fingering the b flat by the way i'm doing regular b flat fingering yeah remember you've got uh three options you should use any that's easy for you if okay. that one bothers you you might want to explore using the b flat lever i'm not saying you have to I think you should use the easiest B flat fingering so that you're not distracted by the key work. Let's try those scales again and why don't you play them once slowly, each one. Very good, Ellie. And that's what I would, now that you have that clarified, you could try playing now each one closer to tempo but not connecting them yet. So that you have time to think between them. Try that and see if it works for you. I think, I think that's helped us figure out the area to spend time on from what I'm noticing, I believe, is it's the A flat to the B flat and or it could even be just the pinky coordination, you might want to spend a bit of time playing. So determine which area of the scale you need to spend a little time on. Is it the fact that it's an unusual pattern or do you need to do a little bit of exercising, technically the finger coordination and feel free to take and isolate any group of notes out of any passage and just work on them individually. Does that help you there as you look at how to practice that? Yeah, absolutely. That's really helpful. And then last of all, in that run on the way down, there, the grouping of it, it usually ends up being... What am I showing? The right thing? Yeah. I'm doing the wrong thing. You may want to clarify that, which I think you already have, that the first one is if it's almost an incomplete version, because later on it starts on A, right? Natural. So. I would just clarify that in my mind, because sometimes it then feels uneven, which it sounds like you had already done. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Did I explain things well enough? Is there anything I could explain in a different way? Uh, I think that's it. Um, the, the emphasis in talking about the support was really, really helpful. So thank you so much. For all and you might find it helpful to practice things like that once again, slowly, as in... <laughs> where when you're playing slowly, you'll be able to have time to observe your air column and your embouchure work and remind me are you finishing up at uh, you finished at interlochen is this your last year yeah i just finished um i just graduated last saturday oh great and where are you where are you going on college wise uh i'll be going to the royal academy of music at the university of london oh terrific that should be very exciting yeah um, who will you be studying with there uh paul edmund davies terrific that should be a great experience going abroad. I think uh, probably, Yuna is probably uh, ready to, to begin the next section because I want to make sure I don't run too far over. So congratulations to Ellie. So Yuna, why don't you take over and let me know if I'm mispronouncing your name because nothing is worse than having your name mispronounced for an entire hour. No, sounds good. I think you said my name right. <laughs> All right.
All right, at this time, we'll be taking a group picture with everyone in the master class. So well, if you want to be sure featured my, on our website. shirt is showing there. So can you see the, uh, the logo? Yeah, I Actually, love it. What I should do is get rid of that so it's not in your way of the picture. <laughs> okay, and I'll be taking a picture. Nice, nice, Anne. In three, two, one. Okay, I'm going to take one more just in case. Three, two, one. Yay! All right, now that that's over with, we'll be moving on to the Q&A portion of our master class. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Thorne? Sasha. Hi, I'm Sasha. I'm from Atlanta. Um, so my question for you is, what would you say is like the most underrated body part that's involved in the, um, like in flute playing that you would say is like ignored a lot? Abdominal support for the air column, absolutely hands down. I find that to be the common thing that most students struggle with. In essence, uh, I think it was someone, one of William Bennett's students, the, the great English flutist who, who just died. It was very touching. All, so many of his students created uh, all these great posts on all social, social media, different websites and different places, just talking about how he influenced them. And someone I believe reminded me of the fact that he would have a student bark or cough because those same muscle groups when you cough <coughs> that's the deep abdominal action and those are the same muscles we want to use when we're supporting the tone so the things you use when you cough or sing or when people imitate a dog barking roof, that kind of a sound those are those those more powerful muscles and when you engage those you have a lot more airflow did that help answer your question? In essence, those muscles, it's learning to turn them on and keep them on throughout the exhalation. And then when you breathe, you release those muscles and then you've created a vacuum and the air rushes in that actually, in my opinion, breathing, if you relax the muscles you've used to exhale can largely be passive. You just have to get space open to let the air rush in. And therefore, when you breathe, you actually return to a relaxed state. So I think those muscles are key. Excellent question. Who else has a question? Don't be shy. I'm glad to have all kinds of questions. Please come on in. Did you say Kara? It's Kara. Kara. Okay, thank you. Um, this is more of a question about Northwestern. Yes, um, ma'am. Is it possible to schedule a trial lesson with you? And then how will we go about doing that? I think absolutely. Uh, people oftentimes there are two things happening now with COVID. Some people are a little hesitant to practice. I'm always happy to meet with students and feel free to share this with your colleagues if you know of anyone who asks questions. I think most people at these days are comfortable meeting with students for prospective lessons via Zoom, especially because it's expensive for you all to travel to these schools. And as you are already thinking about, if people are looking to apply, you have application fees, You've got a lot of things to be thinking about. So I think Zoom is certainly a good option. Some students feel that they want to see the campus and meet in person. And I think when COVID rates are lower and they're obviously dropping on the, in the Northeast, I think will be down. We're currently high in, in Chicago. But I think when you feel it's safe to travel and your family agrees, then it is always a good idea to visit a campus if you can do so safely to have a lesson in person, but also to see the campus, to observe the campus when cl classes are in session. I would encourage you to do that. However, it is expensive and you should never feel that you have to do that. I think a live audition is very important. And that can be when you go to visit campus and meet with a professor in person. But I wouldn't be shy in any way about asking a prospective lesson either via Zoom or in person, depending on what's best for you. Did that help answer your question? Yeah, it did. And then is there a way to reach out to you by email? My, or... my Northwestern email address, which you will find under my bio, it's john.thorn at northwestern.edu. Okay, but perfect. If you don't remember that, if you just go to the Northwestern site, if you go to the Beanin School of Music and then search faculty and then search woodwinds, 
then that'll take you to the Woodwind page and you'll see there's my, my email address. All right, thank you so much. Yes, I, I'm always happy to meet with students. Usually with Zoom lessons, I don't charge unless the person has, uh, I'll usually ask, say, why don't we meet for 20, 30 minutes? Because you have to figure out if someone's got a good connection and an external mic. So usually what I'll say is let's just meet for a little bit of time. I'm glad to hear you play, answer some questions. And if someone's got a good setup, then we can plan to either meet for longer or schedule another meeting for an hour and then I would charge a fee. Uh, but it's, it's, um, I think it's always good to meet with people. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Thorne. You are welcome, Kara. Who else have we have, Yuna? Does anyone else have questions in this room? I have a question for you. Yes, Ellie, go first. And then I'd like to learn something from all of you about your experience with Doremi. Okay, so obviously as a college professor, you hear a lot of live auditions every year. Yes. And I absolutely adore asking this question. What is something that people do in like live auditions that you find incredibly um, either makes them stand out or something like that is just like they walk in and you're like, oh my gosh, like, you know. I mean, I, I, first of all, auditioning is hard. I, and I think you have to realize that I think anyone who's listening to auditions should have an attitude of humility. It's a lot easier to listen to an audition than to play one. And if anyone has an attitude when someone walks into the room of, oh my gosh, that's not being particularly helpful to the situation. The job of the people who are running an audition, whether it's a university or an orchestra, should be to make people feel comfortable. It's an awkward situation to go play for people you don't know at all and have to go out there and perform for people. So I think the most important thing is for the professor to encourage the student to start with something they like to play, to give them a moment to warm up. I tend to do 20 minute auditions because I want a student to have five minutes to start to settle down as opposed to one of these five or 10 minute auditions where they feel like they barely got their feet on the ground and the person is saying thank you very much. It's not an orchestral audition. It's very different when you're auditioning, say, for the Chicago Symphony or, or National Symphony or whatever orchestra in your area where they need to know that you can deliver with, that, with very little time to get comfortable with the situation. I don't feel that way at all uh, when people come to audition. So I have to honestly tell you, uh, each audition is unique to the person and the performer. I'm not looking for someone to be uh, a cookie cutter or no particular type of, of audition itself. I would encourage everyone to know their repertoire thoroughly. I know sometimes people will come in for audition repertoire. It's different than in a master class situation like this where you're learning something and you want to get some ideas. But I would know the complete piece. You may only be offering one or two movements of it, but I would know those movements thoroughly. And I would, I think the best thing is to bring in the material you, you feel represents your best playing when you audition. So if someone feels like I've got to play Ebert Concerto, but it's not the piece for them, don't play it. Play the pieces that you, sh that show your strengths, because I think at this level, we're looking for potential, not for perfection yet. And I think that's, uh, you should relax and play your way and show them how you approach the instrument. Did that give a, a, enough clarity to your question? Because that's a very complicated and long discussion that I'm just giving a brief answer to. Yeah, absolutely. That was great. I, I, I would hope that any student when they're auditioning for Northwestern never gets the feeling that uh, they are, you know, like they come in and that I'm disengaged. If someone has taken the time to fly in and play an audition, or with COVID, we had to meet online. I would want to be there and be listening and let them feel that I'm trying to provide them an opportunity to play their best for me. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am, come on in. I, I think you were talking to me. Hi. Yes, um, yes, 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 thank you. Okay. To kind of go back to that question, um, do you have any music in particular that you're looking for? Like when you say like showcase your strengths, um, what if 
the music that was brought to you was something more contemporary, like, like, for example, per se, um, <laughs> would that be an acceptable, like, supplement to an audition? Of course, with, like, those, like, standard repertoire, but, um, performing contemporary music like that for an audition, is that something that's okay to play, or do people Absolutely. really want to hear Mozart and Bach? No, no, no. I think that's great. If you feel like you, when you play contemporary music, you really play your best, I would bring it. Now, the only challenge there is if it's a piece that I've never heard, it's a little tricky. But in terms of all the pieces that are very popular now, Charanga, all of the, the Ian Clark works and Shulamit Ron, Eastwind, most people will know those pieces. It's a little tricky if someone brings me in a piece that they said, well, I premiered and I've never heard it before. But, uh, you know, if someone plays something very well, it's if I have a copy of the score, that's helpful because some people really feel at home in contemporary repertoire. So when I'm auditioning, I, there are no required pieces at Northwestern because I don't feel that it, it should be that someone has to be able to play Chantalinos and if they can't play it well, I wouldn't accept them. There's some people for that's not their piece and they play another piece of music very well. So I don't have those kind of elimination pieces personally. It doesn't do anything for me in particular. Other people may feel that's necessary. That's, that's their you know, prerogative for choosing people for their flute studio. But I don't have any pieces that I require. It's just a piece from the, I believe, Baroque and classical uh, class and, uh, or, and then romantic era is mixed in there, 20th, 21st century, and a couple of excerpts. You get to choose what you want. I think there are too many auditions where they tell you exactly what to play and exactly where to play. I'm more interested in how somebody plays than what they play. If someone plays a piece of music very well, that actually tells me more than if they play a challenging piece not as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, show them what you got. Play what you love to play. And I think that'll help you do your best. So you don't feel like you're trying to measure up to a kind of a cookie cutter situation of I got to play what other people are playing. That's often a holdover too from a lot of the state, you know, uh, competitions where everyone plays the same thing. I would choose repertoire that helps you individuate yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? You know, did you get to ask any questions? <laughs> um, I did have a question, but are you okay with going like a bit more over time? I just wanted to. Check. I'm fine with that. Yeah, no, and and I told you know I think it's so great that you are doing this. I'm very happy to meet with you all, and uh, it's not about uh, fees or timing. It's really about people who are interested in sharing their knowledge, which I think you are all doing with the work you are are volunteering and the time you are giving so if i could ask you what do you think of the main things that you see in the students you are meeting with who are you are willing to tutor and mentor and work with um did you mean like specific traits that we see in our students yes uh issues that you find challenging to explain or work on or common uh, issues that uh, the young uh, flutist you are working with encounter? Anything that you've noticed? Yes, please, come on in, Aaliyah. Um, so I notice this a lot and I, I notice that you have a really nice way of explaining it, uh, but I struggle to help my students, particularly with their tone and just like the physical shape of their mouth I think like when I was learning, I, I teach a lot of things that I've just learned from experience as I've grown, but tone was not really something that I really like worked on. It was just like, I just practiced a lot and it got better over time. And I, I don't really know exactly what I changed about myself to get to where I am. Um, but I don't, that's why like, I think I'm having trouble explaining that to students, especially explaining it in such like a simple manner because there's so many like face shapes and things I like, things I could change that I don't know how to explain to like a 13 year old. Well, I, I don't think, first of all, learning, teaching is a learning process and none of us start out knowing how to do all that stuff. So the search for the information 
is where the teacher learns from the student in terms of you thinking about, well, what am I doing? Or when I listen to whatever flute player whose tone you admire and you hop on YouTube or their website and you start watching their videos and you're thinking, what, what are they doing? So I think the biggest thing about being a teacher is willing to, to learn from the student by observing at what they are doing, comparing that to what you think might be other options and noting the difference. So it's, you don't have to say to a, one of these young students, look, I have all the answers, uh, but let's work on it together. And you have such a great resource, which when I was your age, I wish I had, where you've got so much video content to observe and recordings. I mean, you, you don't have to go physically, either take it out from the library or buy it if, and, and save the money for it if you have a streaming service. And even those who don't have the money for one of the streaming services, they can hop on YouTube and endure a couple of commercials and see these famous players. So you might want to help these young students by identifying some performances they could not only just listen to for free or on whatever streaming service they have, but also watch. And then ask them to compare what they notice that performer doing. You might find a video where you can really see up close what Paul is doing, or, or Lorna McGee, or um, Buryakov, or all the players that people admire. You know, uh, Jasmine Choi has so many video uh, up content up there, and really watching and examining what they're doing. And that might be something where you could give them some things to listen to or watch, and then see what they come up with is the difference between how they're using their embouchure. You're right, it takes time, and I think eventually it's just the doing of it as in most things that will get you where you need to go. But you don't need to tell them, I have all the answers. Let's see what you notice and what I notice and talk about it together. But how am I able, should I be able to identify like what's like different from I'm sure I don't, I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, but is there one like, cookie cutter uh like set obviously no. forever okay great because i no. didn't think so but how can i identify that especially through just a digital platform like if i was standing in front of them i'm sure it'd be much easier for me to identify it but when they're through a screen it's especially hard for me to see like, what they're actually doing with their face zoom is is hard and it depends on the connection and what kind of device the students are using what is the range of devices in that your your students are transmitting are they using laptops? Are they using phones? Are they using iPads, uh, desktops? What do you notice in general? I think laptops. I Probably. think for the most part. If that's the case, then just ask them to get, and don't be weird, but you can get them closer to the camera so that you can see. And in some ways that can actually be easier than feeling like you're getting in someone's physical space when they're teaching, where you may need to see their embouchure and you don't, you know, some students don't like someone getting too close to them and you have to be very respectful of people's personal space. It can actually sometimes be easier via computer. You can say, get right up in front of the camera and let me see what your embouchure is doing. And you'll be able to observe, observe and if they're recording the session, they too will be able to watch it later on and they'll be able to see what their embouchure is doing. So recording oneself in the lesson uh, and taking the lesson and recording it, whichever way you want to look at it, will be very helpful. There are, I think John Krell, I grew up in, at, uh, in the, what they would say is the Curtis School, the Kincaid School, having gone to Curtis when John Krell taught there with Baker. Baker was very famous and everyone thought, oh, you have to go study with Baker. To me, he wasn't a very compelling teacher. He was a great performer. He played the flute very well. So I, you would learn by watching, but he wasn't about to explain anything that didn't really interest him. So it was kind of a, a teacher where if you were good at teaching yourself by watching, you would thrive. If, if that wasn't the case, then you were kind of on your own. But, and I was good at m mimicking and observing. So it was helpful, but John Krell was much more of a pedagogue, and he's the one who wrote that great book, King Kadiana, which I encourage everyone to read, where he gives that very brief discussion uh, of an embouchure that it's like both a, uh, a, a pucker and a, like a whistle and a frown. So you'd, you'll feel like, 
and then also not letting the corners get up too high, as if you're blowing across a hot uh, liquid that you're trying to cool. I think he then describes that you know you're going to be playing on the inner wet portion of the lip where it's not so cracked and dry, and that you'll have that kind of relationship of the embouchure. It's a very complicated thing to talk about in just a couple of minutes because a lot of students get confused. The embouchure, when you're moving the embouchure, you're actually moving multiple muscle uh, groups in in different planes, and so it's a little confusing. The jaw will be feeling like it drops or it, it drops or closes a little bit. It moves on a hinge. So that moves a bit like this, meaning your teeth getting closer together, the jaw will raise. Your lips will feel like they're moving across the lip plate slightly to cover more of the embouchure hole or less, while you also feel like the space between the lips, the aperture for a low note is wider and for a high note is, is more circular and and smaller it's a lot of moving parts uh just like someone breaking down someone's bow arm where yes the shoulder is involved yes the elbow is involved yes the wrist is involved and yes the fingers it takes time you might so in any case you might want to do a little bit of quick reading of of some uh of the the main books that people read i think kincaidian is very helpful you will notice that there is not a ton of instruction in writing as to what one does with the embouchure. There are different approaches. Some people play what's called rockstro method where they roll the head joint in and then roll their hands out. That's kind of anathema to the Curtis school where you kept the head joint in general more in line with the, uh, with the, key, uh, the keyboard itself. There is no one way. The last thing I would give you a bit of advice is that each student has different shape of their mouth. A lot of students these days will have uh, braces on, so their embouchure will be changing a lot. And that once the braces are removed, they'll have a different shape to behind the teeth. You might feel you need to kind of hold off on identifying exactly the changes they should make until their braces are removed. But in general, some people have a slight, some people can have an overbite, some people can have an underbite. So the position of the head joint, whether it's rolled in or rolled out, and I would suggest in general that people who have an overbite, like in essence what the expression people use as having buck teeth, tend to roll out the head joint a bit more because their angle of the air is further out. That's what's right for them. Someone with a tremendous underbite where the lower lip is in front of, in some way, the upper lip will probably need to roll in. It takes a fair amount of experimentation, uh, but I think the Kincaidiana helps explain in terms of the coverage of the embouchure hole that when you're playing a low note, you're covering less of the lip plate so that the volume of the air can get in. And then as you play a high note, you cover slightly more and also aim the air higher because it's not a huge volume of air that needs to get in there, but it's pressurized air. So I know I'm wandering all around all over the place because there, this is, this is an hour at least on its own. However, you may want to ask your students to purchase a book that Roderick Seed, S-E-E-D, who was a student of William Bennett published, say it's titled, uh, mastering the Flute with William Bennett. It has some really fun exercises for students to work on, and I think even your, your beginning students might find them fun. But even working on harmonics with someone who's had a bit of experience would be helpful, and he explains how to do all that. Was that too vague and too convoluted an answer? No, that was, that was very good, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Hi. Yes. Um, actually, my students are here right now. Susie and Sarah, they're in the Hi, box. Susie and Sarah. How are you doing? <laughs> so in general, like I would say for me, the hardest thing to teach is, um, <laughs> there she is, um, uh, I... is musicality, just because it's such an intuitive thing and it's so hard to teach. Oh, there things. you are. We have two people yeah. now. We have, <laughs> we have a third person there. All right. Yeah. Lots Hi, of sisters. Susie. 
Um, so I would say like, what, would, what are some tips you have on teaching musicality and other skills that are very intuitive based? I think a lot of the times in the American school, they will teach you that this note is called A and you finger A on the flute like this and it sounds like this. So they would say, you know, the, the second um, uh, space is A, we finger A like this on the flute and then you have them play. But I think a better way of doing it is saying this note is called A. On a score or in the staff, it's notated in the second space. And on the flute, and you could even, if you have a piano, say it on the piano, it's this key. And on the flute, this is how we finger it. Because oftentimes students are looking, in essence, they're t learning music through a mental fingering chart as opposed to hearing it. And I think the most important thing to do is to teach a student to hear something before they play it. In Europe, back in the old days, and I don't know what it's like now, solfege or ear training was common. And so even before students were playing instruments, they were taught to read music and hear, hear that and sight sing something. And a lot of flute players, you know, we start later than violinists or pianists and we, we start when we're nine or 10. And one of the best things you might tr teach your students to do is to listen to some music. Perhaps you could identify some interesting recordings that aren't too long so that that uh, Susie and Sarah don't feel like they have to listen to a 20 minute long sonata, but they might listen to a movement of this piece or that piece where they start to hear it because you have to get it in your ear. And I was just lucky that when I grew up at the age uh, where I grew up, a lot of radio was still popular. And in my house, I grew up with radio on, whether it was classical or jazz all the time. And my dad had a huge, huge recording collection and I just used to listen to stuff and I like to listen and that kind of trained my ear. So I think listening exercises can be helpful because we music is a language and like any language, we have a proclivity for communication. We innately start to learn our mother tongue, whatever your languages are being spoken in your home. If you can encourage your students to realize they have already done the greatest challenge in the world, which is learning how to walk and talk. And it's no harder to play an instrument than that. If they can wake up that kind of initial toddler infant uh, ch ability to imitate and learning that to have learned to play the flute is no different than when your family was trying to teach you to say the word dog. And you'll notice in your siblings or your parent or your friends, siblings that the family will understand what the kid is saying and you said that's not even close to the word dog but they've been pointing at the dog and saying good and the family says yes that's a dog your job is just to say that the initial attempt of a, of a of your students isn't necessarily incorrect it just needs to be refined okay you know that that's a good attempt on the first the first pronunciation of that phrase let's try and clarify it a bit just like your parents did for you when they were teaching you to say Sasha right if they spoke slowly that's right it's Sasha you may have missed the H or the sh in it which is a little bit more complicated for a toddler and they just help you clarify that until you made the correct sound does that make sense I would say break it down for them and analyze how you're putting things together and then work on these little structural nuggets of information. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think Anything? this yes? concludes our masterclass because it's already been going on for 30 more minutes. It is, but... and you probably have papers and exams or school's over and you just want to be done. So it was great to meet with you all. And I think it's great that you're volunteering and giving your time because one of the things that's most important of all to remember about music is that it's an oral tradition, meaning A-U-R-A-L. You have to hear it. And it's not enough just to be handed a, a piece of music and a flute. It's important for someone to help you develop the skill to recreate that like we were just talking about as our parents or our siblings or our friends have taught us to speak a language. 
So thank you for passing it on because that's what music is all about. So I'm impressed with all of you for doing this on top of everything else you have to do. And it was a great opportunity to meet with you all and all my best wishes. And uh, Susie and Sarah, keep practicing. <laughs> all right, thank you. And thank you, Yuna, for organizing everything. You were so yep. organized and on top of it all. And I'll keep my shirt with pride. Thank you, thank Mr. You. for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Have a, Have a good summer. night, everyone. Bye. Goodbye.